All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this past September, I had the privilege of sharing my journey of being pregnant and a parent while managing my narcolepsy at the Wake Up Narcolepsy Summit in Rochester, Minnesota. When I was asked if I would be willing to speak on the same topic, topic again, it was an instant yes. I have spent the past 15 years figuring out how to best manage my narcolepsy symptoms and going through pregnancy and into parenting has been an entirely new and different journey. While I don't have all the answers, I hope that by speaking here today, I can help at least one other person feel less alone in managing their narcolepsy symptoms while being pregnant and a parent. Before I share my story, I want to acknowledge my privilege. Being insured is something I've never had to worry about. Throughout my narcolepsy journey, I've had easy access to medical professionals that could support me without having to worry about whether or not I'd be able to pay my medical bills. While I've had to fight a lot with insurance companies to have them cover the costs, it has never prevented me from being without any medications. I am also thankful that I have the flexibility to not work, thanks to my partner, Russell, who is able to support our family as the sole earner, which is a situation that I know is not often an option, especially for people living in this area. While my personal circumstances may be different from others, I believe the challenges I have faced managing my narcolepsy symptoms are relatable. My journey towards becoming a parent started roughly five years ago with an online Google search, narcolepsy plus medications plus being pregnant. My search evolved from there uh, with, will my symptoms be worse when I'm pregnant? Uh, will my, my baby be impacted by my sleepiness? And my questions went on and on with no conclusive answers. Around the same time, I stumbled on a social media post from Wake Up Narcolepsy advertising their new support group pregnancy and parenting with narcolepsy. The first session I attended, I think I was the only one apart from the two facilitators. But the initial one hour virtual meeting was all I needed to know that I A, found the right group and B, could do this. While the group was tiny, it was a safe place where I could share, listen and learn from others who had paved the path through the hazy landscape, that is, managing narcolepsy while pregnancy and beyond. My two pregnancies were very different when it came to my narcolepsy symptoms and how I managed them. My first pregnancy, I decided to go off all of my medications completely. This decision was based on the lack of information surrounding sodium oxalate's possible impact on the fetus. Since no one in the support group had stayed on sodium oxabate while being pregnant, it cemented my decision. Well, back came all of the symptoms that I had been that had been mostly dormant for almost the last decade. Insomnia, hallucinations, delusions, vivid dreams, and excessive daytime sleepiness. While I disliked having to deal with all these symptoms again, I didn't have any other responsibilities. So I napped during the day when I needed to and continued to focus on taking care of myself. When Damien exited my body, all 10 pounds and two ounces, I immediately knew that I had made the right decision in becoming a mom. My second pregnancy was an entirely different story though. I now had an active toddler to care for full time. Napping was something I could only do when Damien was also down for his nap. The need for sleep was often so overwhelming that I would cry and beg Russell to stop work early so I could rest. I was hopeful that the excessive sleepiness would fade a little bit once I hit the se second trimester, as it did with my first pregnancy, but it didn't. I started feeling miserable every day with how exhausted I was which in turn started impacting my mental health. I, yeah, please stay here. <laughs> yes. yes, please stay. <laughs> I decided something needed to change and maybe going back on sodium oxabate was the best solution. Uh, by now I had met many other moms during the support group, some of which had stayed on sodium oxabate while pregnant. Hearing their experience while staying on it while pregnant helped me, 
helped make me feel like I could, it could be a good option for me as well. I spoke with my husband, neurologist, and OBGYN about pursuing this option, and they were all very supportive. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the overarching theme in each discussion was that my mental health was important and necessary to have a healthy pregnancy, and more restful sleep was a key factor in that. To be careful, I met with a high-risk OBGYN for my 20-week ultrasound who had worked with other patients who had stayed on sodium oxabate during pregnancy. We talked about the risks, benefits, and unknowns related to using the medication while pregnant. Thankfully, the ultrasound showed that the baby was growing well, and the OBGYN didn't have any concerns with me going back on it. So I started taking sodium oxabate again at a lower dose just to be cautious, and it was the best decision I could have made for myself and the well-being of my family. I continued taking it up until giving birth to my second boy, Miles. And if you can't tell from this picture compared to my other birth, it was a lot easier the second time around when you don't have a 10 pound baby in 24 hours of labor. While managing my narcolepsy while being pregnant was challenging, I found that nar managing my narcolepsy postpartum was even more challenging. Yes, newborns do sleep a lot, but they also require around the clock feedings. Breastfeeding both boys was something that was really important to me, but nothing could prepare you for the amount of energy and time it takes to actually breastfeed a newborn. I would spend 30 minutes breastfeeding and then have to hold them upright for 30 minutes. By the time I'd lay them down to sleep and get myself back into bed, I'd sleep for an hour or two at most, and then be awoken by a crying, hungry baby. After uh, The night feedings were the hardest for me, and I really had to rely on Russell. After nursing, if I felt too tired to hold and burp them, I'd wake them and hand off the baby so I could go back to sleep. Because feedings were so close together and really unpredictable, I stayed off sodium oxabate. But there came a breaking point when both boys were newborns, where I felt like I was going through the everyday motions, but not enjoying any of it because I so desperately just needed sleep. Oh. <laughs> With Damien, I started back on one dose of sodium oxabate when he was about two months old. The most valuable information I learned from the support group was that it was possible to take sodium oxabate and still breastfeed. Since sodium oxabate leaves most people's systems within four to six hours, this also meant that it would leave my breast milk as well. So we made a plan for night feedings that allowed me to sleep for six hours. It took some trial and error in determining what block of time in the night we were each on baby duty. But once we had a good system, I started to feel more like myself. Uh, when Damien was about four months old and sleeping through the night, I went back on two doses. With Miles, we had a similar schedule, but no two babies are alike, and Miles was definitely more challenging than Damien when it came to sleep and feedings. But since this wasn't my first time breastfeeding and going on medication, I felt more confident going back on one dose of sodium oxabate when Miles was one month old. While the pregnancy part of my journey is over, the parenting part has just begun. Damien and Miles are always changing. According to developinghumanbrain.org, 90% of a child's brain development happens before the age of five. I currently have a four-year-old and an almost two-year-old. As the main care provider, it is my job to help guide them through these changes, which, to be honest, is often just as challenging for me as it is for them. While my narcolepsy symptoms are well managed when I stick to my sleep routine and take my medications, some days I'm inevitably more tired than other days. When I'm extra tired, I often lack patience and tend to not respond to others with the respect that they deserve. Just ask Russell. If I snap at him, he has learned that either tired or I'm hungry or both. <laughs> I'm constantly trying to come up with new ways to manage the parts of my day when the tiredness hits me. After lunch is
is commonly a challenging time for me when Miles is always occupied while I rest. I don't always fall asleep, but just closing my eyes often helps me. I used to be hard on myself about the amount of TV that Damien had, but then I realized I can't take care of the kids if I'm not taking care of myself. Yep, life is chaotic with kids, but it's 100% worth it. Hello, uh, my name is Timothy Stroud. I am originally from Illinois. Uh, currently live in Louisville, Kentucky uh, since 2010. Uh, I am married to my beautiful wife, Caitlin, uh, for 16 years. And I have four children, Brody, who is 15, Torn, 14, Lillian, 12, and Adeline, 10. It's a pretty busy house. Outside of being a husband and a father, I am also a person with narcolepsy. Uh, I was diagnosed with narcolepsy type 2 in 2015. However, I got my initial uh, symptoms when I went into puberty, but I had no idea. Um, I always just associated it with being busy, playing sports, hanging out with friends, getting a job, and so on and so on. So after receiving my diagnosis, it really helped answer a lot of questions about my past. I could go back and really pinpoint a lot of things that I did or didn't do and could just then really direct it back to my narcolepsy diagnosis. Like this makes a lot of sense. It really helped brighten things. As much as you don't want to find out that you have a condition that has no treatment or no, uh, no way of curing it, it's, it's nice to have that name. So you can really dig in deeper and understand it fully. It, it's, it's, it's such a weird thing. It's like, I'm happy to have this, even though I'm, I'm not at the same time. Uh, so it presented still some new challenges and opportunities, you know, for the future after getting my diagnosis. So learning about it, that was really my first step. Uh, I owed it to myself and to my family uh, to learn about my new diagnosis. I wanted to know everything I possibly could. The more I understood, the easier it was going to be to explain to others, uh, either in my family, coworkers, and then eventually my children. So... Uh, my young children, it was it was difficult at first, uh, but I really wanted to make sure that I wanted to kind of direct it towards them that they could understand. Because at the time of my diagnosis, they were seven, five, three, and one year old. So it's a little bit harder to go into detail, you know, with those age ranges. So I knew I had to kind of, you know, work it differently for each of them. Uh, um, but as but notes to me, I actually had started kind of prepping them for this conversation before I even knew I had narcolepsy because I knew that there was issues with my sleep. I had known it for a long time and just never got around to taking care of myself, which is really what I should have done. Uh, so those discussions uh, before I got my diagnosis, I just knew something was off with my sleep. So I, I never felt well rested. Still don't to this day. Uh, but I, I just could contribute this to work. Uh, I thought maybe it was from staying up too late. Maybe it was just because we kept having children. You know, I was, you know, being being the father, no, I didn't have to wake up and do all the night feedings and stuff like that. But um, my wife is a registered nurse, so she would work night shifts at the beginning of our marriage. And I would have, you know, when she worked, I was dad the whole day long. There was no one else around. So I had to get to to a really good routine uh, to really make things work for me. And, and it, it wasn't easy. You know, it's for mothers, it's always going to be that one step harder. But, you know, it, fathers have their, their own difficulties um, when they're managing their, their young children. Uh, I used to tell my kids about how daddy was, was really tired and just needed a break. You know, that was kind of the ways of getting them in, involved. It's like, daddy just needs a nap. It's like, you need your nap, daddy needs his nap. Uh, most of the time I could nap when they napped, but that wasn't always the case, especially the older they got. But then we decided to, for, for whatever reason to keep having another child. So then I had to kind of rework it and say, okay, well, you're not taking your nap anymore, but this one's taking a nap. So daddy needs a nap. Uh, so I created this little game called the daddy bridge. And what the daddy bridge was is that I would lie on the ground, take a nap, and they would crawl on my back as like a bridge. 
And so I kind of got a nice little massage. I got a little nap. It wasn't much, but I could just lie there with my eyes closed and not have to worry about much because I could feel them on my back. So I knew they were there. So, I, you know, it, it was okay. Uh, and then I would also kind of take naps on the couch and tell them they could climb on me. So they would climb over me, over the couch, fall down, run around in circles, laughing, enjoying. And I'd do that with the television on too, so they'd have their little distraction. So it, you know, th those little things, it's, it really helps. I mean, it, I wouldn't say it's the best parenting advice ever in the world, but, you know, sometimes when you've got a condition like narcolepsy and you're the only parent in the house, you got to be creative. And that is something that worked for me. Uh, as I mentioned, nap when they nap. It, it, that's what most new parents want to do anyway, is nap when the baby's napping. I know that there's a lot of other things that need to be accomplished. I wish I was able to do more around my house, clean stuff up, do the yard during those times, but no, it, it was it was nap time. See, she knows nap time is, is good. Uh, I wasn't, uh, you know, I was unable to do everything that they wanted to do, which was very difficult for me because of my exhaustion. Uh, I really wanted to be able to go out and take them to parks more. It's so easy to look back now and and really point out all the issues that, you know, were there and, you know, all the things I didn't do. You know, I, I really wanted to do more. I like to be an active person. I'm not allowed to be an active person because of my narcolepsy, and it's it's very frustrating. So after my diagnosis, I started having those real conversations with them, uh, you know, still so they could understand it. You know, it's it's still a, a little age range difference. So uh, they were similar to the pre-diagnosis discussions. Uh, I would explain how it doesn't matter how much I sleep, that I would always be tired. Uh, I just never feel well rested. They, you know, it's it's, you know, I let them know. You know, the times when you want to take your nap, that's how Daddy kind of feels all day. Like I, I don't get that well rested feeling, and uh, you know, they could they could relate to that. And I let them know, you know, when they stay up late for a sleepover, or if it's New Year's or a fun event during the summer or something, you know, how they get really tired the next day because they stayed up late. They don't stay up late that often. I say, for me, it, that's every day. It's like, it feels like I've been awake for two to three days in a row. And that's my, my every day. So for them to, to kind of understand off of something that they could relate to, I thought was very important. So getting them to, to know that it's like, you know, you're, you're tired from being up all night late. That's daddy every day. But I didn't want them to think that, you know, anything negative about me either. It's like, you know, I still push through. I want to do things for my children, but this is something that they need to know at an early age. So that way they don't feel attacked in a way later in life. Be like, why didn't you say anything sooner? You know, we could have helped you. And, and, and it did help, uh, the older they got, you know, they started doing more around the house and, and helping me out and letting me rest. Uh, so it really started to sink in for them when I talked about, um, the two to three days without sleep mentality and, uh, so I also talked to them about my memory kind of goes. I don't always remember everything they've told me or what I've done. You know, sometimes they'll say, you weren't very nice. I'm like, I, I don't remember that at all. I assume that it probably happened. You wouldn't be bringing this up for no reason. And that's really hard to hear. Um, and my listening skills suffer as well. I tend to zone out and... Some people say that's what it's like to be a male, that you just zone out. But no, it, mine, I, I daydream a lot. Um, I've already done it multiple times while I've been talking. I've found myself thinking of something way over here, and I'm like, well, nope, back to my topic. Um, yeah, so my listening skills, so I let them know. You know, I apologize. I'm so sorry. I wish I can know these things in advance so I could kind of alert them before these things happen. But that's that's a lot you can't you know you can't always predict the future you can never actually predict the future so um so as much as it seemed like they really understood i, I know they can never be 100 percent sure and i hope that they'll never be 100 percent sure because i don't want them to have to go through this either but i i keep an eye on them you know the older they get my symptoms started at puberty my boys have gone through puberty there's you know going through that that change so i i ask questions i want to make sure that you know, when they are tired, it's not just, you know, them being teenage boys 
I want to be alone in my room and don't want to talk to anybody and take a nap or play video games too late, you know, tired. I want to make, you know, I, I ask them the questions that I get asked, you know, from my sleep doctor. Luckily, so far, so good. Uh, but with the, my children, structure. If I don't have structure in my day, I can't just wing it. As much as I like to wing it, like I'm kind of winging this speech right now, I got some notes, but I'm winging most of this. I like to have a lot of structure because uh, I find it difficult to just get up and do anything I need to do. If I don't plan it out, I'm going to have troubles. So I, I'll, I'll go to work for the day. Currently I work from home, which is amazing. But when I was going to the office, I would come home and everyone would say, why do you come home and start barking out orders? It's like, you just got here. It's like, we didn't even get to say hi to you or hi, you know, I love you daddy or anything like that. I just start barking orders. I'm like, well, if I don't just immediately get into that stuff, it's not gonna get done because I'm gonna lose all interests or lose all motivation. And I, I don't like to do that. I wanna seem like a bossy dad or partner spouse, you know, I just want to, but I, I need to make sure that stuff gets, gets accomplished. Or if I sit down, I'm, I'm done. Yeah, it's, it's it, you know, so I've really got to put structure in my days. Um, even if I, I know I have rest in there, if I lock it in my head that I know that I'm making dinner or we're going to this event, this sporting thing, I know, okay, I need to be up by this amount of time and put this much effort into this beforehand so I don't overdo it. Um, one really major thing for me and, and I'm sure others is having a supportive partner, which not everybody has, um, whether on purpose or situations, you know, having a supportive partner, which I did have, um, really, really helps a lot. Uh, I know that I'm not always the best at acknowledging it, especially to her, which I should a lot more. But uh, my wife, Caitlin, she's very supportive and she would just pick up the slack. That's how she is anyway, as a person, you know, her being an amazing uh, RN and, you know, being able to just pick up the slack, you know, Tim needs to rest, he needs to sleep and, you know, getting emotional. So, excuse me. So, she would take you know take over a lot of stuff, and and then the pandemic hit, and she became a travel nurse to help others, which was amazing. So it put a lot more on me. Luckily, the kids were all in school at this point. So I was a full time worker from home, and I became a full time dad single dad for chunks of time you know she wouldn't be gone for too long but she would travel for two to three days at a time um and they were doing school from home so i became a teacher so that was difficult for anybody but then to put my narcolepsy on top of it made it so much more challenging to manage how to get through the day luckily my employer allowed me to take half day is so I would only get paid half my paycheck but I could work from eight to noon and then after that I could get the kids food and then I could work on school work with them for the rest of the day one kind of positive thing about the pandemic was that we weren't leaving the house so I did not have to worry about leaving to go to events so we were all at least stationed in one spot so that was somewhat helpful but it was it was a strain you know for for everybody and, you know, it was very, you know, great of her to, to be able to go out and help others. And I could give her that support back, you know. So a part of that supportive partner is, is my driving. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine at driving most of the time, but I've noticed more on my longer trips, it, it'll hit me. Like, I, I do not like to stop. I'm not a pit stop kind of guy. It's like, unless someone really has to go to the bathroom, or we need gas. That's it. It's like I don't. I, I my my driving is how fast can we finish? Not because I like to race. I'm not that kind of guy. I am more of a 
this is not fun for me. I want to be done so I can rest. So it's it's me skipping ahead to the rest. So my I'm like, how can we finish this in as many, you know, as few stops or whatever. I reluctantly allowed my wife to drive some of the time. Um, you know, she wanted to. So that was, it was very helpful that, you know, she would jump in and drive a couple hours. I could nap in the back. Then we would swap. So after everything I've tried to teach my kids and having them understand, I decided to do a little test to see if they actually know about narcolepsy. And I have not read these. I had my wife ask my kids three questions about narcolepsy and get their answers. So we're gonna find out together if they know anything and if I did a good enough job of kind of teaching them about this condition. So let's see. All right. And a lovely card for my wife. <laughs> There's not a check. No cash. I was hoping something would fall out. Yes. All right. So, first question What is it like having a dad with narcolepsy? So, my oldest, Brody, um, he said, basically, having someone in your house who is constantly fighting to stay awake, to do their responsibilities. and spend time with family. Torn, my 14 year old, not good. <laughs> Sorry. It's not good because based off what he says, it's really tough. I need to have someone else read these. Lily it means having a dad that is not always able to do things It means not having a dad that is not always able to do things because of having the struggle of being tired at the same time. Addie. Worrisome because you worry about them and sometimes when you try to help them, they get mad. Questions. What advice would you give to somebody who has a parent with narcolepsy? Brody, give them a break. They're doing their best they, that they can with little to no energy to do it. Torin, cut them some slack. Lily, cut them some slack and keep the condition in mind. Addie, I don't know. Question, what does it mean when someone says they have narcolepsy? Brody, someone has little to no energy with no way of gaining more without possible medical help. Torin, they do not have as much energy as everyone else. Lily, Someone has a condition that makes them tired all the time. Addie, I worry about them. Caitlin? Caitlin answers, it means they have more bad days than good. They are robbed of their self-esteem and self-worth. Tim is an, is an, oh, I'm going to cry now. <laughs> Tim is an amazing father. Having four kids under the age of six has been hard, but he showed up. Tim is smarter and harder working than he gives himself credit for. We are so very proud, myself and the kids, of all you have achieved. So I guess I did a pretty decent job of telling them and having them understand what narcolepsy is. And hopefully, the thank you again for reading that. Um, and hopefully, they won't have to, to deal with this. But for them to understand, and then they can maybe spot it in others. So... That's a thing. I think I do. You think you do? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Hello, all. I'm Elisa Workala. Uh, I'm here from uh, from Seattle, a little place just across the water here. That's that's my baby in the background, uh, baby River. She's nine months old. I have uh, narcolepsy with cataplexy. It's pretty mild, my catap cataplexy, especially these days since I am finally on medication after 
decades of telling doctors I was falling asleep, standing up, falling asleep, driving, falling asleep on my motorcycle. And they would say, drink more coffee, exercise more. I was also a rock climber for 10 years, dangling off of hundreds of feet cliffs. So the advice was pretty bad. Um, I'm, I'm still, when I talk about it, I'm just amazed that they did not take me seriously. And I try to think about why, and I, I have a hard time with that. Uh, my family immigrated to the United States in the late 80s. My sisters and I were born in Brazil. My mom's from Argentina. My dad's American. We did not have the best health care growing up. We were going to clinics that at the time I felt very comfortable and good in because they were the, the ones that I knew. I thought those doctors were so nice. Only when I was in my 30s did I realize that that care was not very good that those doctors probably had a huge client load. Uh, and at some point I um, was accused of drug seeking, which was super disappointing and really actually quite terrifying when they said they were not gonna give me any more medication for my mysterious sleep attacks. So eventually my narcolepsy, which again, cataplexy is not that bad, but my sleep attacks were so bad that I couldn't stand up in a room I was teaching for many years and going to the bathroom during breaks to do jumping jacks or take a nap in my car during lunch. Driving to and from school was very life-threatening. I was constantly nodding off. Uh, the thing that gave me the most relief all throughout my life was physical activity and a lot of adventure. So pre, I'm 40 now. I was only diagnosed at 36, 2020, 20, 20. Yes, 2020. Um, up until that point, I was just doing everything I could to feel awake. That meant cold water therapy. Nothing in this world makes me feel as alive as jumping into a body of water that's half frozen. It's very exhilarating. Um, for, for a while, motorcycling at 121 miles an hour kept me awake. And I would have gone faster had my motorcycle gone any faster than 121 miles an hour. That was the, the max. My doctor, I told him that, my good doctor now, the one who finally diagnosed me, and he was like, oh, you're one of, you're one of those people with narcolepsy, okay. <laughs> Not the first who has ridden their motorcycle way too fast. Um, I would do things like ride my bicycle down the West Coast, or at least try to. I tried to ride my motorcycle around the world. I got about halfway around uh five continents i'm um, maybe 75,000 miles i cannot tell you how many hundreds of miles i actually rode my motorcycle asleep this was again pre-diagnosis i wouldn't necessarily recommend that as a therapy to narcolepsy uh but it was quite quite an adventure it did get to the point where um well actually the around the world motorcycle trip i eventually got a mosquito virus that put me out of commission for quite a few months but during that ride I felt like I had these boxes behind my motorcycle, sort of like on a string and sort of banging down the road with me. And I kind of knew, I was like, eventually you're gonna have to go home and figure out what that crap is back there. You're dragging it around with you. You don't want to analyze it too closely. The mosquito virus, maybe it was sort of fortunate because it did make me end the trip and come home and get medical care. And I finally was like, all right, let's sit down and figure this out. One was that I was a queer person living a pretty straight life and that I really needed to come out to my mom and dad who lived half a mile away and they were definitely going to find out at some point. The other one was that I was literally falling asleep on my motorcycle and standing up and had already switched careers multiple times because staying awake was so difficult. That journey of getting diagnosed, even when I finally recognized that this is extremely life-threatening either to me or to somebody else you have to get help that was still a major ordeal and still took a couple of years my first sleep doctor when she asked me about cataplexy which I had never heard of she said do your knees buckle or get weak when you laugh and I was like what no my whole body does and she was like okay that's not cataplexy according to the textbook description it's your knees so she did not diagnose me with cataplexy which is uh, obviously you all know that's 
crazy, right? And so this went on for a while. I was so terrified of the medical establishment at this point of getting accused as a drug seeker and being told that they wouldn't see me if I couldn't go and get the sleep study, which cost thousands of dollars. And I had really bad insurance that wasn't going to cover it. Also having to be off meds beforehand, that was way too life-threatening. So at that point, I was just like, okay, just don't move. Like, just don't rock the boat, you know? I think also coming from a Latin American family where there was a lot of upheaval in Latin America in the 70s and 80s, terrible things going on with the government. My mom, having lived through that, said to me, don't cry in front of a doctor, don't rock the boat, don't question the pharmacist, because they might get mad at you and, and not give you care. So that was not helpful. That was her experience growing up in Latin America. That was something that I had to really learn how to advocate for myself. Uh, and that really didn't happen until I was like approaching my 40s. Eventually, I got into a different sleep clinic and I walked in. I actually, I couldn't talk. I had somebody talking on my behalf and uh, telling my story to the doctor. And he just looked at me and said, I'm so sorry. This is classic narcolepsy. And this is just the experience of so many people with narcolepsy, unfortunately. He really helped me figure out a plan. First, getting on methylphenidate and trying various things. Eventually it was the sodium oxabate that was the most life-changing for me. It still took a, another couple of years to regulate, as you, I'm sure many of you know, how hard that is to find the right balance and dose and what works and what doesn't work. And uh, finally I did. It was, it was a very dark time that I experienced like a lot of rage through. <laughs> The whole coming out process was enraging and the whole nobody has paid attention to me when I say I'm falling asleep standing up for 25 years rage. In 2022, I was getting very close to 40 and I was single and I just had this surgery that I had to recover from on my own. And I remember laying in bed thinking, well, I guess if I took care of myself all of this time and was able to do all of these things with narcolepsy and survived it, maybe I can have a baby on my own too. And that, I swear to, I swear to you, that happened when like one day I was like, okay, I'll have a baby. Similarly to lots of these other adventures that I was like, mm, I'm going to do that. If I had a superpower, that would be it. I'd be like, what do I want to do? Even if I am very afraid of it. Oh, that's the thing I want to do. Okay, how do I how do I get there? So the next couple of years was super scary because my doctor told me that there was no way I could be off medication and pregnant. So suddenly I was like, oh, well, there's no way I could ever do that. I cannot be off my medication and get pregnant and survive that. I can't go back to those dark years. That part makes me very emotional. Um, I have a lot to thank this organization for because one of the one of the um board members who I know personally told me, you know, there's a parenting with narcolepsy group. And again, I'm not going to repeat some of these things because Emily has already spoken of them. And it's just like the very, very similar situation. I spent one session with that group and I was like, oh my God, this is something that I can actually do. Okay, let's do it. Um, having a baby as a solo parent by choice is not easy. You know, there's some biology there that has to get figured out. <laughs> so, um, I, I got myself a maternal fetal medicine doctor and they talked me through it and I found a midwife to help with um, getting pregnant with donor sperm and that didn't work. I ended up having to go through IVF, which was very expensive, especially as a solo person. But now I have this amazing child and she's the light of my life now and <laughs> life just suddenly makes more sense for me. Um, I'm so grateful that I have been able to manage being a solo parent with her and continuing the medication that has been the, a, quite a journey as well figuring out the timing of everything and the first the first couple of months of uncertainty and being home alone with her so much of the time i'm very fortunate that my mom is close and was able to come over for a few hours at night but i was it was me and baby a a lot of most days just the two of us so navigating that was tough um Kim here is holding my baby. Kim is my girlfriend who lives in a, another city, not too far away, Olympia for you who are local. My support network has certainly grown. Kim has been an incredible support to me and loves my baby. And 
And when they come over, hopefully we try at least one night a week, maybe two. Um, it allows me to sort of just gently like shove my child towards her at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> and so I can get a, a little bit more sleep. Um, I'm also very fortunate that I found a career that works with my narcolepsy so well. So I went from being a teacher for many years to being a, a writer, sort of a dream job, writing anywhere in the world about motorcycling and and uh, and hiking. And here's what you need to bring on your next big hiking adventure, that kind of stuff, which put me to sleep within five minutes of being at the laptop. But now uh, I'm in real estate. This is my... fifth year and loving it. And that means that I don't happen very early in the morning. It happens late at night, which is my natural awake time and during the day. So a lot of good things have happened. Um, I'm pretty sure that forties are going to be like the best years now, you know, moving forward. I do hope to have a second child. So I <laughs> appreciate and fear some of these things that I'm hearing. Um, I've always thought that, you know, things do work out if you have a positive mind about it. And even if it's a very scary, scary thought to at least try to embrace that and try to figure out where you want to go. You spoke about this, some of this earlier, which really resonated with me. Um, and then sort of plan on how do you, how do you get there? So that's where I am now with the idea of potentially having a, another baby. Thank you. There, there's so much to unpack across your three stories of navigating um, either pregnancy or parenthood with narcolepsy. And I think that it was so informative and um, really highlights the gaps that exist in terms of care and conversation and care. Um, uh, so one of the first things that I would say is that I would like to highlight your story um, uh, and yours of that when you look at the current literature, there is no evidence-based guidelines to say, what should I make as a recommendation for pregnancy? And part of the challenge there is pregnancy is not nine months. Okay. Um, uh, it all depends on one, how long it takes to get pregnant. Then there's the whole pregnancy thing, which actually is about 10 months. <laughs> and then there's the after pregnancy. And um, I have become very passionate about this because I didn't go through in vitro, but I was told I was going to need in vitro because it took my husband and I several years to get pregnant. And I always reflect on that because many women are told you have to be off all of your medication to get pregnant. And that's wrong. It's not accurate. <laughs> um, and so uh, it is a matter of having an informed conversation around what is the risk benefit of treatment versus non-treatment and your specific treatments. As a child neurologist, in addition to being sleep medicine, I always will reflect on the fact that sudden infant death syndrome can be a real thing and that can occur from falling asleep in inappropriate places. Untreated parents can be at risk for that. An untreated mother who has narcolepsy with cataplexy, she can have a fall and placental abruption, and that can lead to a hypoxic ischemic injury and death of the baby. So I say these things not to be scary. I say these things to be factual, that there is not any other medical condition other than high, high cholesterol, because babies need cholesterol in order to develop, that we say you should not treat it. This rec recommendation just highlights the stigma that exists for narcolepsy being an invisible disease. And so I would advocate for any person who is on the pregnancy journey that you do have, these are my desires, because there is a strategy that can be applied pre-pregnancy and then differ by trimester and by pregnancy, 100%. In terms of parenthood, the other part that I would like to highlight is number one, the fact that you all are highlight are have very much showcased how to parent successfully with narcolepsy. So I don't know if people have told you that before, but I wanted you to hear that because it's a hard thing to accept.
<laughs> parenting by itself is hard. And when you throw any chronic disease into it, it makes it that much more difficult. However, you being so forthright as to these are my unique strengths and weaknesses and involving your children is powerful, but also being aware of this is where I need help. Sometimes we try to also, you said it, power through it, <laughs> but being able to recognize when we need to wave the white flag as to I need someone else to come along on this.